Our next uh, speaker has <coughs> certainly come a very long way. Um, Dr Tom Pickerel joined Seafish in the UK Seafood Authority in July 2013 after moving from California where he was the Senior Science Manager for the Seafood Watch program at Monterey Bay Aquarium. Tom worked at Shellfish Association of Great Britain where he managed the UK shellfish industry development strategy. He was a fisheries policy officer at WWF UK and also worked in a variety of roles in the UK government in the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, including the Alaskan Responsible Fisheries Management Scheme Conformance Compliance Committee, that's a mouthful, <coughs> and also Vice Chair of the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative, better known as the GSSI, as a process expert working group. He has a degree in marine biology, a master's degree in analytical biology, and a doctorate in shellfish, aqua shellfish aquaculture. Everybody, please welcome Dr. Tom Pickerel. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Congratulations on the rugby. Uh, don't let the accent fool you. I'm Scottish, so if you do win, it was a dodgy decision. <laughs> so anyway, not bitter or anything. So um, yeah, like I say, it, it's an absolute pleasure to come here. Um, I've already had a number of interesting conversations with many of you here. And uh, it's, it, it's interesting to see how similar the challenges are, and in fact, Graham's presentation, if you just tweaked a few things, we could easily give that back home and it would be entirely relevant. So I think that's good in a way. There's some opportunities for collaboration. It's also a bit tragic in that there's so many challenges that are still there for us all. But uh, I like to look at the positives and maybe the, you know, the opportunities for working together and maybe learning from each other can actually lead to some positivity. So, what am I going to be talking about today? Well, I'm going to be talking about a couple of different things that we're doing in the UK. And after speaking to you, I think there may be some opportunity for some sort of transfers of things over here. And certainly, I'm going to be taking some of the things back with me, back home, and see if we can put them into practice. But uh, before I begin, it might be useful to sort of tell you about the organization I, I work for, Seafish. CFIS is the um, UK Industry Authority, so we're a statutory body, we're a non-departmental public body. Uh, we're funded by a levy on the sale of seafood um, that's, that's landed into the UK and also imported into the UK. There are some exceptions. Uh, we don't take levy on uh, canned or tin products or diadromous species such as salmon uh, and eels. So it's a, it's a bit of a, an interesting one there. Uh, we have a budget of about £8 million a year. So that's, uh, it, it's quite significant, and we have a team of 80 people. And we're having a conversation last night about how that compares to FRDC, which is probably the most um, similar organization. And it was quite surprising, the, the numbers of staff, the difference in the numbers of staff. Because we're funded by industry, we actually respond to industry's needs, and we have uh, an arrangement, a government arrangement, where the industry actually decides how we spend the levy. Uh, and you can imagine, with a, we're, we're trying to represent uh, the catching sector, the aquaculture uh, producers, and the members of the supply chain as well. And they don't always agree on what are the priorities. But we've got a good system in place uh, where people actually can come together and actually realize that what we're going to do, it may, not appeal to, it may not have every single thing you want, and maybe not everything we do is relevant to everyone, but the, generally the, what the response we get is what we're doing is pretty much the, the best that you can get for pleasing everyone. Now, we do report to the four fisheries ministers in the UK as well, so uh, our, our remit is decided by industry, but we report uh, to the ministers. Our mission uh, is, is supporting a profitable, sustainable, and socially responsible future for the seafood industry. And we actually added socially responsible uh, in April when we had our new corporate plan, and that was at the request of industry. Social responsibility is a real key thing uh, for us back in the UK, and I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail. And our vision is to be the authority on seafood. Uh, and that really is sort of a play on the word of uh, seafood being an industry authority as well. So what I wanted to do is really talk about selling our successes. So really falling under the selling our stories. But how do we sell the successes? And when I was thinking about this, I think, well, who are we trying to sell the successes to? 
So I looked at some data we've done, some research we did uh, earlier this year on when customers go into the retail environment, what influences their choices? And it was really interesting when you look at the results because what many of us are, are sort of led to believe is sustainability as the number one priority is actually very low down on the list when it comes to people actually making purchases. And I don't think anyone in the room is going to be surprised that you see the ease of purchase, the ease of pre preparation is very high up. The value for money is number two on that list as well. So people are really interested in the, the convenience and the price. And sustainability, when they're actually at the sort of the fishmongers in the supermarket, is actually quite low down on the list. And when we ask the question, what would make you buy more fish, again, we see a similar pattern there. Lower prices, by far, the, the most important factor there. And if you look at uh, where would we sort of so, so, um, the responsibility or sustainability of the product, again, it's quite low down on the list. So, you know, does that make us have to sort of question what we're doing? Is it, could it be that simple? Uh, well, well, no. And um, it, it's obviously not that simple. What people say and what they do, you know, are quite different. And we are just getting to, to grips with social license now. Uh, I know you, you're well ahead of us in social license in Australia. We're, we're really just getting to grips with it ourselves. And, and it's coming up with some interesting thoughts for us that this explains the data. This explains why people are actually saying that uh, sustainability is important for them, but when they're actually making the purchasing, it's not. And if you actually look at some information, I've taken this from the Marine Stewardship Council they did last year, I believe. It's two thirds of people think it, well, two thirds of people believe it is important and actually will, are making that uh, commitment that, you know, it is important. Sustainability of seafood is important. This is what we're looking for. But when they actually make the decision at the counter or at the till, it's slightly different. But the important key point here is, this is, this is what people believe in. So, what are we doing in the UK about this? So we realize that um, you know, when we're looking at uh, our successes here, or selling our successes, who the audience is. Now, I actually use something I picked up from WWF, which is called the theory of change. And it's, uh, it's pretty commonsensical when you think about it, but often you don't have to get to that point. Now, what WWF says is, if we want to make some real world change, we have an opportunity to convert seven billion people or we, if we want to improve the sustainability of the, uh, the seafood sector, we could talk to one billion producers. Or we could just talk to the three to four hundred most influential buyers of seafood and tell them, you need to be doing this, this, and this. And by doing that, by getting sort of the narrowest point in the supply chain, you can actually cause the, the biggest sort of leverage of change. Now this works for any, any, anything really, any sector uh, or any process. And it's something that we're trying to adopt in the UK as well, using the same approach. We don't necessarily need to be selling our successes to the consumers, do we? If we can actually sell our successes to the people who are buying the seafood. So we're trying to do this in three different ways. Uh, and they are interlinked. And I'll, when I go through the presentation, you'll see how they can be interlinked. But there are three of them, so the use of innovation, the provision of alternative tools, and being ahead of the curve. And I'm going to walk through each of these one by one with a couple of examples of what we're doing. I like this quote, uh, it's Thomas Edison, um, there's a way to do it better, find it. And I think this really sums up uh, Project Insure, which is sort of the key aspect of my talk this morning. I'll walk you through the issue we have in terms of inshore fisheries, and it has been covered already uh, in, in some extent. So, In the EU, a lot of the science, or most of the science funding, is directed to quota species because that's, uh, that's the requirement of the common fisheries policy. So we put the, the, the money we have onto research into quota species like uh, cod, haddock, for example, and put that information into the, uh, the EU sausage machine that comes out with the advice of the quotas. So there's a lot of focus on that. And as you know, money is not unlimited, so there, has to be, there is going to be winners and losers in this situation. However, um, many of the quota species are, are outside, or most of the quota species are outside six nautical miles, which means, in the next step of the cycle, that there's going to be a lot of uh, research that's not carried out in six nautical miles. Now, there's a lot of vessels that are under 10, uh, under 10 meters long in, this, in that sector, in the inshore sector. Uh, and in fact, there's about 75% of the vessels. So following the circle round, you can see uh, many under 10 meter vessels are targeting fisheries that don't have a lot of science. And because they don't have the science, and they don't have the ability to demonstrate their, 
their, their performance, their environmental performance, they're not getting into the supermarkets or the other retail suppliers who, are, who have made these commitments to only sourcing stocks that are demonstrably responsible or sustainable. So you end up having a large section of the fleet, of our domestic fleet, that's pretty much excluded from the, the market access. So what we're looking at, how do, we, how do we break this cycle? How do we provide this information uh, that will enable the, the retailers to say, yeah, you know what, we can buy this. This does actually align with what we've said. So that's, uh, you know, that's the key point there. How do we actually get that information to the, to the guys who are buying the seafood? So, and this, this really ties in with Ian's Robin Reliant. How do we determine an effective and efficient, in terms of uh, the, you know, the, the amount it costs to do it, method of assessing data poor stocks? And how do you actually be able to define that? And how do you demonstrate the responsibility there? So you actually do it, how do you define a level, and how do you promote that to the supply chain? The whole purpose of this is to enable them to actually start buying from these fisheries. Within England, we have bodies called uh, Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authorities. They're, they used to be called Sea Fisheries Committees, and I think the name was better. Um, they're dotted around the, around the coast, you can see there. Um, obviously, that's Wales, so they, they don't have any, but uh, around here. They get, their jurisdiction is out to six nautical miles, and they're in charge of the management of living resources there. They do a lot of firefighting. Uh, they, they work very hard. There's some great people in the IFCAs. Uh, but they don't really have the, or they didn't have the ability to actually work collaboratively and strategically. They were so busy dealing with issues that were coming up and up and up. We decided that it would be useful to work with them or work for them to try to help them come up with a strategic approach. I'll give an example. There was often two IFCAs neighbouring and doing different stock surveys on the same actual fishery. And it was very little collaboration between them, not because they didn't want to, just because they didn't have the time to do it. They were so busy with the day job. So working with the Marine Stewardship Council and the Shellfish Association of Great Britain, we came up with an idea that could enable them to actually have fisheries management plans to put them into practice and actually target what they were doing on the most priority areas rather than just doing what they thought was the right thing. There was an awful lot of lobster tagging exercises going on, for example. I think because it's pretty straightforward to do and you get good results out of it. But is that the key area they, where they should be putting their scientific resources into? And this is what we came up with. And this is about innovation. We're not actually inventing anything new. We're just trying to use the system that exists to do something a bit better. The first stage of Project Inshore was to map the English inshore fisheries, to so actually determine what fisheries were out there. The second stage was to use the Marine Stewardship Council pre-assessment to pre-assess those fisheries of note. Um, and we use that term of note to demonstrate fisheries that were worth more than £100,000 a year in terms of uh, turnover, or those that were sort of culturally significant. Once you have the results of the pre-assessment, you can go one of two ways. You're ready to proceed to a full assessment should you wish to be certified. Um, and if you don't wish to be certified, at least you can still demonstrate that you're at a performance level that's equivalent to the MSC standards. But we were very much leaving that to the fisheries in question. We didn't want to, uh, we didn't want to push them into certification because that got a bit of resistance at first. In fact, the conversation went, uh, the fisherman said to me, well, you're pushing us to MSC. We don't want that. Well, you don't have to do it. Well, why not? We might want it. You know, a typical conversation. <laughs> and just nod. Now, if you weren't at that performance level, what we wanted to do was say, right, well, we know where you are now. We've done the pre-assessment. We've got a baseline. So this is what you need to do to get to that level. So it was a gap analysis. But it was the first time we'd have all this information in one place. So this was the plan. To make sure we had buy-in from everyone involved in this, we set up a governance structure. The MSC took the lead on uh, running the project, which was very good. Um, good of them to do that, but also good because they actually had that you know, continual buy-in there. We had the regulator, we had, um, we had DEFRA, the, which is the uh, UK government responsible for this. We had Natural England, which is the statutory advisor for all things environmental, so it was good to get them on board. Uh, we had the managers themselves, we had um, Seafish to be involved, we had the industry, NGOs and members of the supply chain. It was important to have all these people on the governance structure so they knew what was going on, they could tell their other colleagues what was going on and make sure the information was disseminated about what was happening with Project Insure. We also had a number of project partners who some of them were also involved in the government, some were just putting money in, but you can see we had quite a broad spread of people who were interested in this and keen to, to see what the opportunities were. 
particularly for members of the uh, supply chain. They, they want to buy these products, but they, was, they were sort of hamstrung by the commitments they've made. And so by seeing this project through to the end, they can actually buy them and demonstrate why to their, the NGO partners or anyone who's saying, why are you buying that? So this was the results we got. We determined 450 species gear um, combinations in the English inshore sector. So we're sort of essentially classing these 450 as unit of certifications. When we went to stage two and pre-assessed them all, we had around about 50 uh, that were at a level that were short, or pretty much immediate to medium term move into a level that was uh, consistent with an MSC pass. That surprised us. Uh, to, it surprised some of us that there were that many. It also surprised a number of people that there were so few that were at that level. But what it did do was it's actually given us that information to actually make decisions going forward. So far, we have produced 30 fisheries management plans, and there are two full assessments that are planned, and I'll come on to those in a little bit. So you can see we haven't we've delivered what we plan to do, but this, it's still an ongoing process of doing this. This is not something you can just you can't just produce 450 plans automatically. There needs to be some time for the, the inshore fisheries and conservation authorities to actually bed in and take this data. They can't do everything at once. So we had to focus on what were the priority fisheries for each region. Uh, and these are the ones we identified. And that picture, if you're unfamiliar with the joys of eating whelks, that is a whelk. Um, you can see there's a lot of the management plans that we produced were for shellfish. Uh, and that's not surprising because most of the shellfish species don't have quotas. So these are fisheries that uh, are going to be limited in the data, uh, in, the, in the, uh, the formal stock assessments. So these were ones that were really sort of necessary to have some additional stock assessment work. They're also very high value. Except most of these species, if not all of them, are a very high value. Whelk, I believe, is an 11 million pound a year fishery, which is an incredible value for something that about 95% is exported to mainly Korea, I believe. So these were the management plans we've got. Now these are with the IFCAs now and they're in various stages of implementation. In terms of those fisheries that were uh, ready to certify, these are the ones we determined uh, met um, score of 80 across all the principles, which if you're not familiar with the MSC process, which means this would, these fisheries would probably get a full MSC certification, uh, a full pass if they went through, an unconditional pass some surprises up there, uh, not real surprise with some of the gears, they're certainly the, the lower end of the impact of the gears, but what this does do is it gives us a, a much greater picture than we had before we did Project Inshore. But we were not aware that some of these fisheries were so high performing. Uh, this is uh, another set, these are the ones that uh, they meet the 80 score guide for 1 and 3, uh, but between 60 and 80 for principle 2. Again you can see we were surprised by some of these. We didn't expect them to be some of these fisheries to be here. So, that, you know, Project Inshore had already got some value from that. And these ones, are, these are the fisheries that would very much need conditions to go through, but still we're at that reasonably high level. So I won't run through them all, but you can see this gives us a lot of information that we didn't have beforehand, just by the fact of doing this pre-assessment across a number of different fisheries. And that gives us information to make informed decisions on what we do next. And a lot of the fisheries involved in this now have the opportunity to take this forward should they wish to. The biggest surprise, certainly for me uh, and some of the other members of the team, was how well North Sea Cod did. And in fact, it's pretty much at the time of the pre-assessment was nearly there. And if you actually look at the right, I, I made it a bit bigger because I wasn't sure you'd be able to see it. I'll give you a chance to have a quick read of that. Now, I'm sure you've heard of North Sea Cod and the fact that it really has been the sort of the, the poster of bad fisheries management, uh, along with a couple of other uh, enigmatic fisheries around the world. And this is the one that gets all the headlines and this is the one that everyone focuses on when the quotas are announced in December in, in the EU. What this is saying is we are the only thing that is stopping North Sea Cod from getting MSC certified is the fact that the stock status is below uh, the precautionary level. This is the spawning, the spawning spot biomass from this year. It came out in June. You can see these are the, uh, the limit line and the precautionary line. It needs to be above this line here to go into MSC certification. Uh, it will be conditions until it gets over the 
uh, the, uh, the precautionary level, uh, but it's fantastic news. Uh, and it was announced at the, uh, Humber, uh, the World Seafood Congress in, early in October that a group of uh, industry members and members of the supply chain are actually putting North Sea Cod through for MSC certification, which I think will be a game changer in terms of uh, the seafood industry. It's something we're very proud of, uh, and certainly industry is very proud of, uh, for all the hard work and um, efforts they've done to get this happening. And this is all on the back of a very, very low recruitment, uh, which is important to say because this means that all the recovery we're seeing is due to the fishing mortality being reduced rather than any environmental conditions like a galloid outburst or something like that. So this is sustainable, a sustainable growth. The success of Project Inshore was such that uh, we've had a lot of interest from people in extending it. Uh, you may wonder why are they just doing it in England? Well, the reason we just did it in England was because of the, the funding streams that were available in Europe. Uh, they do restrict them to the, uh, the member state, and in the case of the United Kingdom, they, they, they're separate funding uh, for England, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, and Wales. And it was very tricky to actually do a cross, um, a, a, a cross regional uh, approach. So that's why we did it in England. But it was such, so successful, and we had such good results from this. We do want to look at extending it to something called, we're calling nominally Project UK. And this is a Seafish MSC led concept, and it is very much a concept at this point. When I get back home, um, I will be having a meeting with a number of the people who are interested in this to actually see if we can flesh this out further. The idea is to use a very similar approach, um, but actually use, bring Project Inshore into this as well. But essentially what we want to do is map the fisheries in the UK, uh, with the exclusion of the ones that are already sort of MSC certified, already at a, a very high level of performance. Again, do a pre-assessment, and then once we're at the pre-assessment, either develop management plans or go into certification, but actually provide the funding to do so this time. And what we want to do is bring in the, the ongoing work from Project Insure into this project uh, under a, umbrella, a bigger funding umbrella. The interested partners to date include two of the big uh, primary processors of seafood in the UK, uh, two supermarket chains, two NGOs, uh, a member of the Scottish fishing industry as well. Uh, like I say, we're very much just talking about it at the minute, but this is, you know, it would be fantastic if we could take this forward. So that's sort of moving on from Project Insure. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the provision of alternative tools. And what do I mean by that? The UK supply chain, as I've mentioned, uh, probably no different from any other supply chain around the world, uh, is focused on responsible seafood sourcing. In the UK, there is a limited support network. That we have the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership and their metric system. We have the Marine Conservation Society and their Fish Online tool. Uh, we also have a number of eco-labels. And there's been increasing pressure uh, on sea fish to say, well, why can't you help us? And why don't you develop your own fish list? Well, you know, we, we thought long and hard about that. And we're in, there is a, it's a crowded landscape out there. And do, does, it, does the industry really need us producing another traffic light system? I don't think we, they did. And so we went down a slightly different path. And what we've done is we've built a tool. It's a seafood sourcing tool called RAS. It's uh, the risk assessment for sourcing seafood. And the important thing about this tool is, rather than you having to align with our philosophy of what is good or bad, this tool allows you, the buyer of seafood, to comply with your own corporate social responsibility commitments. So if you said, I'm going to do this, we'll help you do that. If you said, I'm going to do that, we'll help you do that. What we're not saying is, you must do this. Because I think that's one of the flaws in, this, in the current structure we've got. If you want to follow someone like Seafood Watch, you have to fully abide or fully live their philosophy. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. So there's a number of fish lists and eco labels out there. And this is how they work. They all work in a very similar way. You take the data. You convert that data into a number of metrics. And you convert the metrics into a recommendation. And uh, the first stage is the methodology. And the second stage is the scoring system. And if you take Seafood Watch, and I'm familiar with, um, you can actually see it here. So the final score, so this is the metric, you just tot up uh, uh, and get the geometric mean of the four criteria scores. So this is, this is their methodology. And then you convert that into a red, amber, green rating, and this is the scoring system. And basically, if you're a follower of Seafood Watch, that's what you must do. You mustn't buy anything that's red. You can buy stuff that's green, and you can also buy stuff that's yellow, but really you should be pushing it towards green. 
And that's fine. If you totally believe in that and you totally support that, why not use that system? It's there for you and it's all done for you. But if you don't, if you want to sell farm salmon, for example, then this is really going to, you're going to struggle with this. Because uh, farm salmon is generally red. So, the key point here is this enables you to comply with your own commitments you've made. So how do we do that? Well, we just look at data and metrics. As you see, this is going back to the original one. All we're doing is looking at the methodology. And by that, I mean we create uh, a risk score, we produce a risk score for one of four criteria. Stock status, uh, management, bycatch, and habitat impact. And that's all we do. We give a risk score for each of those. And this is the risk of you receiving negative press. If we put it another way, it's the risk of Greenpeace getting on your roof with a big banner. So the higher the risk, the more likely Greenpeace or someone like that will call you out. We do not amalgamate the scores. We don't produce one overall score. The reason we don't do that is because that by doing that, we're going to have to make a decision on the weighting. What's more important, stock status or bycatch or habitat? And you may have a different view to us, or you may have a different view from everyone else, or we may have a different view from everyone else. So we don't do that. It's up to you. We don't say buy or don't buy. Our philosophy is if it's legal, buy it. Whether you buy it is up to you and your commitments that you've made. We don't say this is sustainable or this is responsible. There's a lot of confusion out there. I don't believe there's an agreed definition of that anywhere. We're not going to add to the confusion. Again, we don't say very low risk is sustainable. The key point here is it's up to you what you buy depending on your appetite to risk. So if you're very risk averse, then you might want to just look at stuff that's very low or low risk. Again, empowering you to follow what you've said you're going to do. This is an example of a, a page from the tool. I've uh, just picked a, a random COD one. And you can see here, at the bottom you see these pips. These are the risk scores. And for a lot of people, this is all they look at. We've tried to keep it very simple, but it's a tiered level thing. We, we, I was actually surprised to hear that a number of fish and chip shops in the UK are using RAS, and this is, all, this is all the level of information they're interested in. If you do want a bit more information, you can click uh, on the tool and just drop down the bar. And I've just clicked there on stock status, gives you a, a one, one or two line summary of why the risk is that. Again, it just gives you a little bit of information at your fingertips. Again, if you want more information than that, you actually want the full level of detail, you click, click again and go to the third tier, and that's, uh, you can imagine that's quite lengthy, and that's the full information, the full data there that we've used to give that, uh, give that rating. Now, what I haven't included in this presentation is a detailed um, overview of the methodology, it, just purely because it's pretty techy heavy. Uh, and I wasn't sure if everyone would be that interested in it. But if you are, I'm very happy to run that through that with you uh, during the conference. Uh, it is available on the website. It's all fully open and transparent, so you can have a look at that. But what we've tried to do with it is have a very simple system that can convert uh, lots of different types of data into a metric. Now, RAS can be used in two ways. Uh, this is where we're getting a lot of successes with the, with the user. Um, the user friendliness of the tool. If you haven't got an internal um, procurement process for buying seafood, you can use the risk scores yourself. You can say, right, I'm, I'm, right here's my system. I'm only going to be going to buy things that are uh, low or very low rated for, for everything, or I can go to medium on this. And you can just use that tool like that. If you have got an internal procurement system, and I give an example of Young's, which is the, the, one of the, the biggest uh, processors of seafood in the UK, they have a very sophisticated decision tree. Um, so they don't need to use our risk scores, but they do use our data. And in fact, we've got some great feedback from them saying, your third, oops, your third tier of data, all the information there, is exactly what we need to plug into our system. So either way, you can demonstrate to um, your, your NGO partners or your customers that you are implementing evidence-based purchasing. I asked uh, my team for some stats, and they gave me some stats up until August. We have 280 profiles on there at the moment. Um, over 3,000 users, um, only a, a small number from, just from the UK, so we're getting user, usership of this across the world. Um, and these are the five most popular um, profiles that I looked at. I was quite surprised, actually. Uh, Big Eye Tuna from the Indian Ocean is uh, number one. So um, obviously that's, uh, that's interesting to know. We've got quite a suite of analytics 
uh, but I thought I'd just give you some high, high level figures there. So it's very much global. So how did, the, um, how did the catching sector react to us going into this space? Well, at first there was some initial skepticism. You know, what are you doing? This is, you know, <laughs> for God's sake, don't say anything bad. Um, but when, when they realized what we were doing, we did get some you know, real positivity back. It was like, ah, right, you're actually, you're being reactive as well. Um, a couple of profiles were put up. We had some challenges from some members of the industry saying, well, you've got that wrong, we use this gear. Okay, but it's not recorded anywhere. Well, we never published the paper. Well, that's great. Well, just give us this, and we can publish the paper. We can put a link to it. We can actually do pretty quick turnaround of information and actually cause changes to the risk scores where appropriate. One of the other things we can do, we can be as granular as we like. We can go down to an, one vessel in a fishery, should we choose to. We, we wouldn't advise it. But what we can do is, if there is a component of a fishery that's doing something different, and that's causing the scores to change, we can call that out. So we can sort of the, the, the grandfather, father, son principle there. We can nest these profiles down to a level of granularity that's right. We are getting a lot of buy-in, and so much so now, we're getting requests for rural regionally specific areas. Now, we do some regional work. Uh, I'll give an example. In Shetland, uh, they've asked for um, the budget that we provide to Shetland to put in place um, some project work to actually produce some Shetland, Shetland Island specific profiles into the tool. That's also happening in the southwest of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So people are really seeing value in this and actually want their fisheries on this tool. Rather than the NGOs, well you can imagine um, the people who were already in this field weren't too happy when we announced that we were going to be doing this. Um, however, once they saw the methodology that we were doing uh, and actually were, you know, they were pretty impressed with what we've produced. I think they were concerned that we would just make up some, uh, yeah, everything's great, don't worry about it. One of the key points that we've done, we're using CFAS, which is the, uh, the Centre for um, Environment, Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences, which is the UK government fishery scientists, to actually populate the profiles. We're not populating anything, so we've got a contract with them to do that. That's produced high levels of credibility. Uh, and, you know, it, that really is positive, and I would suggest if you were to do anything like that, you'd adopt a similar approach. It really pays off in the end. And finally, we're now getting requests for collaboration, which is incredible. Um, one particular marine conservation society are very interested in using RAS uh, and actually taking the information to, to create their traffic light scores. There's also an organization being set up in the UK called the Sustainable Seafood Coalition. It's, a, it's an NGO with members of the supply chain, and they're a voluntary agreement on when they can use the term sustainable and responsible on their products. Now, sustainable was pretty straightforward for them. They pretty much said for wild capture, it's MSC or equivalent. But for um, responsible, they've got quite a complex level of risk factors. And that was all good. Everyone signed up to it. But they realized that it was very difficult to actually produce the evidence. Just as we are producing this risk tool, um, there was obviously a linkage there. So there was an interest in them using the, the, the risk scores here to actually demonstrate what is responsible. Now, I'm very interested in that. It means we don't have to do anything like that, but it does provide a third party um, a sort of level of uh, rigor there in terms of using the term responsible, so conversations are ongoing. The final thing I'm going to talk about is being ahead of the curve. Uh, and this is an area um, that we're pretty proud of the, the work that um, we've done in the UK on, on taking this forward. Um, it really kicked off. Um, two years ago, uh, well, no, it was a year ago, it feels like two, it's been a lot of work since then, um, when the Guardian newspaper did a, a, an article on um, slavery in the, the Thai fishing industry uh, and the fact that uh, the, the, the fish that was being caught by slaves was being turned into food for the prawns that was being sold in the supermarkets. It exploded. And this happened just about the time that the UK government was having, was putting a lot of pressure on the supply chain in the UK for a, a, a collapse of a factory in Bangladesh that was producing um, clothing that was being sold very cheaply in the UK. So all of a sudden there was this kind of uh, pincer movement on the, uh, the supply chain in the UK. You need to sort out this issue. You need to be responsible uh, for the treatment of people that are producing your products, whether they're t-shirts or seafood. Followed up by an article in the New York Times, uh, again, of another very hard-hitting wide-ranging um, article that really transferred that message across the, the Atlantic. And uh, it's not just in the Far East, uh, which is you know, very sad. Um, and we had a presentation at uh, a re recent conference, the World Seafood Congress, that we hosted 
um, from the UK Anti-Slaving Commissioner who made a, a startling um, announcement that there's more people in slavery in the world today than there has been at any other point in history, which stunned me. So what are we doing on this? Well, we've taken a leadership role in addressing social responsibility in the UK seafood industry. And by UK seafood industry, I don't just mean uh, our UK catching sector. I mean the whole seafood industry, imports and everything. And we're doing that through a number of different areas, but I just want to focus on two sort of key areas here at the minute. Number one is the Responsible Fishing Scheme, or RFS, and the second is a risk assessment tool. The Responsible Fishing Scheme uh, is, a, is a global standard um, for, that audits compliance on board fishing vessels, including so health, safety and welfare of the crew. Now we've designed this scheme to complement existing standards out there. We are not trying to duplicate anything or add to the complexities of the, the eco-label landscape. We're also developing an improvers program for those areas of the world that really would struggle to get to this, this sort of high level of standard. How do we bring them forward? How do we improve the situation? This is the standard. It's got five core principles. You can see there's safety, health, and welfare, which really is the key one. We've had the vessel and its mission, which is about the legality uh, and the, the suitability of the vessel for that particular purpose. Um, care of the catch, which is about looking after the, you know, it's not just a fish, it's food, and it must be treated that way, and there's a number of other food safety uh, angles to that as well. Training and professional development, and I saw that one of the, um, I think one of Graham's points was training in the, in the industry. We have the same problem. We need to get people into the seafood industry, and we need to train them as well to stay in the industry and see what the opportunities are for them. And finally, care for the environment. Now, this isn't about the stocks. This is not an eco-label. This is about um, things like maintenance of the engine, so you're not dumping oil over the side, recycling rather than throwing things over, and retrieving lost gear, and also helping uh, scientists with their stock surveys. We're trying to get uh, recognition from uh, ISO for a 17065 uh, recognition there to make this uh, in, you know, quite a rigorous internationally applicable standard. It's business to business. It is not aimed at the consumer. We do not see this being on pack. This is something people are expecting. And it, like I say, it's aimed at just purely business to business. And the unit certification in this case is the vessel and the skipper. If the skipper leaves, the vessel doesn't have a certificate anymore. It comes as a package. And if you're a skipper, you can't take your certification with you to a next boat, because boats are different, as you know. One size doesn't fit all. So we have a standard that is applicable to all different types of vessels, all different sizes. We actually have two standards that sort of uh, uh, dovetail over, over the top of each other. We have a crude standard and a single-handed vessel standard. And if you overlaid them, they, you, you know, wouldn't see any difference. It's just that the single-handed vessel has some exclusions in it. Now, because of the, um, the applicability of this standard globally, you can imagine that some of the clauses are a little bit, um, I, I would say, not loose, that's the wrong term, but they're, they're, they're deliberately written in a way that's applicable from not just a, uh, a UK perspective. So to support that, we've got things called compliance support guides, which say this is what you need to do to meet that clause, and this is what you need to do to meet this clause. And at the minute, we have a number of different compliance support guides for species, and general ones for things like health and safety or food hygiene. The interest in RFS from the supply chain has been absolutely phenomenal, so much so that it's causing me, every time I have a conversation with people, it's causing me to sort of re reassess my timelines on this because people are really keen to get this going and really keen to um, make commitments to this. We have a supermarket in the UK that's already committed to this. We have another one that's drafted the press release and is just waiting for um, some, uh, some other press issue they're dealing with before they actually launch that. And I know there's, an, there's another two supermarkets are waiting for them to do their announcement before they come out with it as well. Um, the chain, a chain of custody standard has been requested by the supply chain. It's something we weren't planning on doing, but it has been requested, so we're now looking at that. Mm -hmm. The international dimension is such as well that we need to accelerate what we're looking at there and also the support for an improvers program, which I will just quickly run through. The chain of custody will be launched in 2016. We are working with Global Gap. We're having a conversation with them to use their standard. We, again, we don't want to add another standard to the landscape out there. And if we can work with them on some form of harmonizing the audits, it makes it better for everyone. So if you have one audit for their chain of custody, it should be equally applicable to ours, which hopefully will make uh, things a lot easier uh, for the supply chain. Again, just saying, we, it, despite having a chain of custody standard, the intention is that this is a B2B. 
there's been a lot of interest in overseas uh, markets as well, um, not just those countries that are supplying into the UK, but for countries that are just interested in, they're, they're facing the same challenges, they're facing the same issues, and they want a standard uh, to provide reassurance for them. Now, the standard is designed to be uh, globally applicable, but the compliance support guides are very much written from a UK-centric point of view. There's lots of references to the um, UK regulations and European regulations in there. So what we're looking at doing is two international feasibility studies to see how applicable is the, is the standard, firstly. We think it's pretty applicable, but the compliance support guides. Do you need a separate suite of compliance support guides uh, for separate regions? Now, we've got Iceland on board, and we're in conversations with Peru as well. So we've got quite different fisheries there. Uh, to see how that actually applies there. So we're you know, very keen to take this forward as well. The Improvers Program is, is going to be designed to deal with those areas of the world that are interested in RFS but are not really there at that level. They have some reputational challenges, for example. Now, what we're trying to do here is make sure uh, that they're able, they're not just excluded from the scheme. We don't want people walking away from areas where there's challenges because we say that doesn't help the problem. All it does is it moves it on to someone else. Now what we're, here, what we're doing here is we're developing a structured framework uh, for improving performance. Uh, and how this works normally in the case of fishery improvement projects or aquaculture improvement projects is you have a standard, uh, you, you assess your performance against it, and then you say, right, I'm currently here. This is an example of a fishery improvement project. This is where I am at the minute, at the bottom. This is where I want to be. I've developed a plan and my milestones. And there's often going to be a baseline, and this obviously can change depending on the, 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 the market or the buyers. And this is the baseline for entry. And a lot of the times it's actually down here. But what it's saying is, I will continue buying from you as long as you're making these improvements. So it's a very positive um, tool to actually deliver real change while supporting the people who are making that change. So for the Vessel Improvement Program, we've got VIP, we love it. Uh, the, the purpose of this is developing a similar structured pathway for getting fleets or vessels within the fleet that have these challenges that wouldn't meet something of the responsible fishing scheme to actually get them up to, the, to, to that level. You can see it's, you know, it's identical process. You're just using the responsible fishing scheme standard as the, the measure of performance. So what are the benefits of this? Well, there's a number of benefits. It recognizes that the applicants are committed to making real world change there. It will drive social improvements, because you have to improve, otherwise you've, you've failed and the market will move on. It enables these areas of the world that maybe are struggling to maintain a presence in the marketplace. It will increase the reputa uh, reputation management for the buyer, and also we hope it will increase the number of vessels in the standard, uh, and hopefully by that way we can actually get some sort of strengthening of this but we believe it is a, a real good tool to actually help address these issues. And if we can get a, a groundswell of vessels going through it, hopefully there's not going to be, end up with 10 other similar schemes on the market, which is not going to be helpful for anyone. So going forward, we're developing the framework mechanism at the minute. Uh, we are, this is not part of my remit. This is something we brought in. So we're actually looking for external funding. We've secured £35,000 already. This is, this, I mean, and it's money that's coming to us. Uh, without us having to go out and ask for it because it's such an important area for a number of different people. But once we've got that sorted, we'll be doing a couple of pilots with this to see how we can take it forward. Uh, we won't be leading the pilots. We're looking for people to help us with that. Uh, there's a, a Ben Trey Fishery um, is, is an example of one that's uh, interested in working with us on that. In terms of the bigger picture, RFS complements fishery certification schemes. And we, we, we use the term the Russian doll approach. What we're saying here is you can bolt us on or we can fit in existing schemes. We are not a fishery certification scheme. We have nothing to do with the stock assessments. So if you are a scheme that's uh, certifying fisheries and you want to add that um, social responsibility component, you can bolt us on. It fully it, it complements. It doesn't overlap. We're talk, having a lot of discussions with the Marine Stewardship Council about this. And we have come up with some language. And if you have an MSC certified fishery and all the vessels are RFS certified, you can say we have a sustainable fishery that's being harvested responsibly. And we're looking to do a pilot uh, of this in southern England. It's a cockle and clam fishery. Uh, and this is the link from Project Inshore. This is a fishery that was identified there. It's ready to go through it. So you can see how these things are coming together. This is a great graphic I uh, borrowed from IFO. Um, and what it does is it demonstrates how we fit in. This is the, chain of, uh, the supply chain, and you can see the, the fishing vessel, possibly the most important aspect of it, 
there's no certifications around the fishing vessel. And what we do is we add that level of assurance for the fishing vessel. So it really fit, fills a niche. We've got the first three vessels certified. We're doing pilots at the minute because the application process is, um, is something we're looking to streamline and make uh, as efficient and as effective as possible. We've got 20 further vessels uh, in pilot audits and we're aiming to do a launch um, at the House of Parliament in January. So the next steps for us is to seek ISO 1705 recognition, um, complete the international feasibility studies and see where that takes us, um, do some VIP pilots, and formalize the Russian doll collaborations with other um, certification schemes. We know that the uh, IFORS scheme is something we're very interested in working with us as well. This is the website. Um, it's pretty simple to uh, remember, seafish.org forward slash RFS. Everything's on there, uh, anything if you're interested in that. Um, and again, very happy to talk it through if you have any questions or any interest in this. Final thing, RAS is uh, obviously just focused on four environmental factors at the minute. We are in collaboration with the SFP and Seafood Watch to develop uh, a methodology for assessing social um, responsibility or ethics. We want a, another word, we're still trying to define that. Um, and what we aim to do is have a very similar approach, uh, but look at social risk factors such as slavery in a fishery, child labor in a fishery, bonded labor, human traffic in a fishery. We're working with an external consultant, an expert in this field, to develop a methodology for us. And what we plan to do is use it in a very similar way. You can see I've just, you know, for example, social risk factor A, social risk factor B, and it will provide a risk level of that for the fishery. This is a tool that's very much wanted by, uh, I would say, EU, UK um, companies. They've asked us for this. They want one tool. And this is very clear. We don't want 10 tools, we want one tool. Hence our collaboration with SFP and Seafood Watch, who've received the same request from their business partners. Again, once we've developed it, we'd very much like to share what we're doing with it. So, take home messages. We can sell our successes, but you need to focus on the right audience. There's no point telling people who are not that interested. We're using the theory of change. It's really working for us by targeting those sort of the, that pinch point. And uh, we often hear that bad news sells and good news can't, but I would say it really can if you've got the right message. And this was from the, uh, the Guardian newspaper um, earlier this year. Uh, this was from the results of Project Inshore. It was great to actually see that, because you can imagine um, every other report has been very negative about that. Thank you very much for your time.